like everything's working. Maybe, I don't know. Do you want to take, do you want to take space to make space for yourself? Good afternoon. Welcome everyone here at the First Unitarian Church and everyone online. We are still checking people in here at the church, and so we're going to delay the start by just a few minutes. Just wanted to make sure that we're going to get started very soon. Good afternoon. On behalf of the friends of the Harriet Beecher Stowe House, we respectfully acknowledge that the ground on which we stand are traditional Miami and Shawnee lands. We extend our esteem and gratitude to the indigenous people who call this place home. Welcome everyone. I wanna welcome you to the 2022 Harriet Beecher Stowe House Lecture Series. I'm Christina Hartley, the Executive Director of the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. And we are excited to be here and to offer you this program with Dr. Taylor. Thanks goes out to the First Unitarian Church for house hosting us today. And because of our ongoing restoration project, there is no way we could have fit this audience inside the house. If you want to find out more information uh, uh, about the restoration project, please visit our website or talk to one of our staff or board members or volunteers here today. The backside of your program sheet also lists our upcoming programs for the remainder of 2022. And after today's presentation, there will be a question and answer period, followed by a reception in the atrium area out there. Thank you to our lecture series sponsor, Houston Group's Cincinnati headquarters have been based in Walnut Hills for more than 50 years. And the group, which includes HGC Construction and SSRG, uh, they take pride in the dynamic history of this diverse and vibrant neighborhood of Walnut Hills. The group's exponential growth in the early 2000s was largely due to a passion for and an expertise in historical restoration. They value history and know that it's important to preserve the past in order to learn and grow into the future. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Taylor. She's a professor of US history and the chair of the Department of History at Howard University. 
She earned her PhD in US history and a certificate in women's studies from Duke University. Her research focus is the 19th century history with a special focus on the history of the black freedom in the age of slavery, in women's history, intellectual history, and urban history. Dr. Taylor has been awarded several prestigious fellowships and grants throughout her career, including the Fulbright to Ghana, Woodrow Wilson Career Enhancement Grant, and a grant to start the prestigious Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program at Howard. She is uh, involved in a $5 million grant Howard received earlier this year from the Mellon Foundation's Just Futures Initiative. Throughout her career, Dr. Taylor has held several academic leadership positions, including as department chair, interim dean, and historian of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center here in Cincinnati. So let's welcome Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much. Good evening, friends. It's good to be home, to my second home, Cincinnati, where I spent so much of my professional career and raised my daughter. I sent her to Walnut Hills, and so I'm really happy to be back. I want to thank the Harriet Beecher Stowe House and my very dear friend, Shelly. Uh, Michelle, I think you guys know her by, Michelle, Dr. Michelle Reuter. But Shelly, had she not invited me, I'm not sure I would have come back this final time. I consider this my last Cincinnati talk. Um, and thank you for all of you on this beautiful Saturday uh, afternoon for coming. Um, so I'm really happy and honored to be here at this church in particular, where my past dear friends were members, Walter Hertz and also Leslie, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh, I'm just really heartbroken that he came to all my talks when I came back to Cincinnati. So without further ado, I'll start with just this story that a student of mine uh, recently asked me a complaining question, a student at Howard. He asked why I too often link history to the present. <laughs> and I told him that my, my own philosophy is that the past is most powerful when it is usable. By usable, I mean drawing a connecting line between history to our lives today, I'm sorry, between history to our lives today to see that the past actually has some very useful lessons. Or we can use the, our knowledge of the past to avoid mistakes. Um, and we see that often in our society. Sometimes the past can explain current social problems, such as the roots of inequality. It is impossible to fully understand or solve the problems of Cincinnati's current social, racial, and economic issues without first understanding its very distinctive racial historical legacy. And many of you know what it is. I'm a firm believer that there can be no meaningful progress towards racial freedom, equality, and justice without understanding the city's history and the journey others have already made before you and for you. There is inspiration and purpose in the past, in history. We look backwards for inspiration, for lessons, and wisdom about how to best move forward. I write, I think I've written three books exclusively about history, yes, three. And I've write, written about some very dark moments in Cincinnati's history. I write about the struggle for social and racial justice that African Americans in this city, not far from the, this neighborhood where we stand, um, how they struggled for justice and how they did it. Unfortunately, so much of what they did is a mirror image of the time that Cincinnati currently finds itself in, in 2022. In some ways, today, we're worse off in the city. Cincinnati stands at the top of a lot of really horrible lists today as some of the most repressive environments for African Americans currently. They did historically, but the sad thing is currently. The city is currently the 26th most segregated city in America, according to the 2020 census, 
and also according to the Othering and Belonging Institute. They have a really great website if you want to look at it. And that's an improvement, 26. It used to occupy the fifth position as the fifth most segregated city in just 2016. But when you bear down on a neighborhood by neighborhood analysis, the vast inequality is even more shocking. WKRC uh, journalist James Pilcher and others did a study for Local 12 just last fall that confirms what we all know. Hyde Park, where I raised my daughter as a single mother in Senator Walnut Hills, was is just last fall 90.3% white and 4.3% black. Somehow, when I lived there in the early teens, it felt like we were the only black family in that neighborhood or in that entire community. The median home, va home value in Hyde Park, $297,000 as of last fall. The median household income, $78,000 um, and some odd change. By contrast, North Avondale, which is 83% black, and the median home value there is just $130,000. The median household income in North Avondale, $20,000. Just 22% of North Avondale residents own their own homes. Similar statistics in the West End. So I don't think Cincinnati can celebrate moving from fifth to the 26th spot on the segregation list as long as these vast neighborhood disparities exist. Cincinnati's poverty rate is at 28.7%. Many of you already know this, which is double what it is in the rest of Ohio. We would really expect that in Rust Belt towns like Youngstown or my hometown, Toledo, but Cincinnati? Cincinnati, that used to be the crown jewel of the state in terms of economic development. Some of us are old enough to remember when we used to call Columbus Cowtown. Do you remember that? We never expected Columbus was bypass Cincinnati and economic development. I mean, can you believe it? Get this, it is a better place for black folks to live by all measures and whites. According to Forbes, in their 2021 study of U.S. cities with populations greater than 100,000 with the highest poverty rates, Cincinnati is 18th on that list. On the same list with Detroit, no offense to Detroit people, and Newark, no offense to Newark people, but we would maybe expect that from those two cities. Ohio and New York, liberal New York, progressive New York, Ohio and the state of New York were the only states with three cities in the top 20 on that Forbes list. Our dear Ohio has zero cities, zero, Zero cities on the list with the lowest poverty rates. All of those sta uh, states are out west. We should all be collectively ashamed. The poverty rate among African Americans in Cincinnati is staggering. 39.6%, which is greater than Latinos, which is about 30%, and three times the poverty rates of whites. Cincinnati is 16th in the nation for extreme poverty, which is a special category of poverty, as you might imagine. The concentrated, concentrated poverty rate, which is defined as, as areas of where high percentage of residents are poor, was 32.4% for African Americans and just 56 for whites in 2018. This means, what this really means is that 32.4% of African Americans in this city, our city, live in hyper-impoverished neighborhoods. Concentrated poverty is a problem because there is a direct correlation between hyper-poverty and high crime rates, low health, low health outcomes, high maternal death and infant, infant mortality rates, low home ownership rates, low entrepreneurship, low graduation rates, and most importantly, low rates of hope. And while we are at it, Ohio as a whole had a high school graduation rate of 83.5%, pretty good. For black Ohioans, it was 67.3%. So that's the state as a whole is not doing well. Ohio in that category is 45th 
So don't talk to me about Mississippi and those other places when you cannot graduate black people in this state. Ohio's incarceration rates for whites is 289 for every 100,000 people. 289 for every 100,000. For blacks, 1625 for every 100,000. Nearly six times as high. African Americans represent 60% of Hamilton County inmates. Black infant mortality rates in 2015, according to the Cincinnati Urban League, was 18.2%. The national average for that was 13.3, okay, for blacks, and 7.9% for whites. So in Cincinnati, it's 18.2%. The lower life expectancy means that as Peter Clark, who attended this church, in the 19th century said, he said this in 1873, I do not forget the prejudice of the American people. It stood by the bedside of my mother and intensified her pains as she bore me. It darkens with its shadows the grave of my father and mother. It has hindered every step I have ever taken in my life. What does this all mean? What do these statistics mean in Ohio, my state? my home, the state we all love. All of those statistics have historical roots. Some of them have 19th century roots, not all of them, but some of them. But they're all a direct result of racism. All of them. Racism has cost this city progress. Nasty, intractable racism has cost this state progress. By holding African Americans back, you hold your own city back. Racism holds us back. The reason Ohio is at the top of all these lists is because the very racism that was baked into the soil in this city, in this state, is still with us 200 years later. It holds back the progress. It holds back economic growth. It stops the city of Cincinnati from prospering. Concentrated black poverty, what it really means is that all the black doctors that your community could be producing are not being produced because a third of them are trapped in hopeless poverty. Concentrated black poverty means that a third of all or a third more quality black teachers that could be teaching in Cincinnati public schools will never materialize because they are trapped in failing schools. Concentrated black poverty means that 30% more innovative potential business ideas die when they are caught in the gunfire of robbery in crime-ridden streets. We are all robbed of that talent as a community. We are all robbed of that genius. So we should all care about what's happening. Social justice is a way to address inequality. Social justice is equal opportunities and treatment, uh, equal opportunities and equal treatment for all members of our society. But in Cincinnati in particular, social justice and racial justice are inextricably linked. Why do I say that? They're the same thing here, or they should be, because most social inequality in this city is racially inspired. Provocative, right? You think real mean the question and answer. Communities are caught in the cycle of repeating the past. Generation or generation, the ones that do, like this one, are ones that have not adequately learned from its own history or their own histories. My entire life's work has been on Cincinnati. I've been focused on proving that so much of what America is is reflected in Cincinnati. My peers all across the country and other universities thought, why do you even do that city? Why do you care? Nobody cares about Cincinnati. Obviously, they're not from Ohio. <laughs> why is it important to you? Why have you written three books on this same city? City, Nikki, what is, what is it with you? It's not even your hometown. Right, but Cincinnati offers this possibility. It's a, a microcosm of America. It always will be a microcosm of America. They say so goes Ohio, so goes the nation. 
I would argue, so goes Cincinnati, so goes the nation. Um, so much of the cultural, social, racial, and economic battles and debates that have been waged here have shaped our society. And I won't go into all of those today, but I'll give you an example. For example, you cannot understand race relations in this country without understanding race relations here in the Queen City. No city has had as much racial violence in the 1800s as Cincinnati, no city, none at all. It had so many mobs trying to force African Americans out of it that the Queen City of the West, which is what Cincinnati was called, was renamed or re-nicknamed Queen City of Mobs. Right there, the hope that the label Queen City of the West had bestowed on the city was replaced with something ugly and anti-black. So from Queen City of the West to Queen City of Mobs, so has been the history. In 2001, those who committed the civil arrest in downtown, you all remember that, right? Uh, they were upset about the deaths of 15 black men at the hands of the Cincinnati Police Department. You remember that? So long before the rest of the nation were captivated by George Floyd or Trayvon Martin, we dealt with this here. We dealt with it in Cincinnati. 15, nobody else can say that. No other city had 15 black men being killed by their police. So that's what I mean. Cincinnati reflects, it's a microcosm of this nation. Again, this proves that the national, the national problems of racial injustice are always reflected in Cincinnati on a more pronounced uh, level. In other words, yeah, this city is one ripe for study and scholarship and analysis. But as much as the ugliness of America is reflected here, I also argue in all my work, so is a lot of America's beauty. And that's why I keep writing about it, because I said, wow, there's beauty and pain in this city. There's pain and purpose. And so it's like this mixed dynamic that makes it really special to me as a historian. Cincinnati's anti-slavery attorneys challenged, effectively challenged the legal machinery of slavery as it related to where you could carry your enslaved people. That was an important part of tearing down the legal machinery of slavery. The civil rights struggle in the 19th century, bet you didn't know there was one in the 19th century. Black people had a civil rights struggle in the 19th century. It began right here in Cincinnati. The National Convention of Colored Men, they called it. it. It started because of the racial violence in Cincinnati, and it became a national movement, okay? So yes, that's beautiful too. Cincinnati uh, is, is credited with having started the push for universal public schools in America. Yeah, I'm really proud of that, that the Cincinnati black community pushed the nation towards universal public schools. I believe in public, I went to private schools, but I sent my daughter to public schools. She went to Walnut Hills, as I said. I believe in them. After I learned this story here, I said, okay, yeah, public schools are very special to me. Um, and I can go on. But now, if we understand if Cincinnati can solve these problems of race, then we can solve a lot of our problems of race at the national level as well. Uh, if Cincinnati can solve its problems of race-based poverty, so can the rest of the state and the nation. I do believe that some of the people in this room are equipped to solve these problems. So that's why I believe you came today, and let's talk about this in the Q&A. There is a certain character and spirit that is needed to do social slash racial justice work. History demonstrates that um, you know many of the allies that African Americans have had uh, many of them who attend or have attended this church in the past know a great deal about resilience, self-determination, extraordinary courage, even in the face of defeat, collective dignity, and actualizing impossible visions of equality, living under circumstances in which they couldn't vote, serve on juries, testify in court against white people, defend themselves, travel freely, work in certain jobs, or attend public schools. Cincinnati, uh, historical Cincinnatians, especially black ones, develop bold, radical visions of justice, freedom, and equality. And they risked everything to try to obtain these visions. 
Today, I'll illuminate just some of the instances in African-American history in this city that reveal the strength of the human spirit. These are not modern stories, no, but the lessons about them are timeless. Uh, history demonstrates in thunderous tones that those who make bold moves, sometimes the boldest moves, are those the ones that shake the foundations of our society and change the course of history. There are three areas that I want to discuss that dictate much about the black experience today, the, thing, the statistics that I gave you earlier, the history of schools, residential segregation, and the roots of generational poverty. For um, many of the educators in the room or educational activists, um, there were far heavier burdens than the one you have today. There were far heavier burdens in the 19th century. You stand on very strong shoulders. The black educational experience for so long in the 19th century was exclusion. Like they just did not allow black kids to go to schools, public schools. And then private schools were created, which were funded out of the dollars of uh, black pockets and black sacrifice and white beneficence as well. Then after finally winning the right to attend public schools in the state, the city of Cincinnati created separate schools for black kids in 1849, but refused to fund these schools equally. One of the things that a lot of black activists talk about today all over the country is unequal funding of public schools. So we hear these things still being talked about today. And so what they did back then to get equal funding or to get funding at all is they sued the state. They sued the city and they sued the state to get equal funds. And, and they turned these schools, these black public schools, into one of the most significant educational experiences in the 19th century. And um, I'll talk to you about that a little bit later, but I'll just say that um, what they did, I, well, I'll tell, talk, talk to you about it now. Uh, what they did in these black public schools is they, uh, despite not having uh, maybe the best facilities, they had deteriorating schools and things like that, they groomed a generation of black leaders, okay? Black leaders, they, they controlled their schools from the pedagogy to the policies. They elected their own school board members. And that was power to, to the black community of Cincinnati. And so the black people that were educated in those schools went on to, to make important gains all across the country. And so that was important. So it didn't matter to them that their ceilings were leaking in their classrooms. What they were doing inside the schools is what mattered. And sometimes, you know, I'm at a black school. Howard University, where I teach, is a black school. And I see the magic of black schools now. I taught at Cincinnati for most of my career, but there's something really magical that happens in the classroom from a black professor to black students that is unparalleled. So that's what was happening in those schools. And that's something that is probably happening on a lot of levels in Cincinnati public schools today. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna skip ahead and talk next about, um, and I'll say so, uh, all black schools in general do not need to have failing results, right? So we don't need to think that because they're all black, they're gonna be failing. They do not need to lead to low graduation rates and low college matriculation rates. So don't have those stereotypes. Just because a school in the West End is all black or wherever, it doesn't need to have those low, res those low outcomes. With black teachers that cultivate leadership skills and intellectual curiosity and teach with a certain level of pride in black history and with a curriculum that is ge geared towards black liberation and service and justice, these schools can become what they, they were in the 19th century. And we can start one classroom at a time. And black teachers are key. Not just in those schools, black teachers are key, period. We need black teachers in black schools. We also need black teachers in white schools because white kids need to have black teachers as well. And so that's another important intervention I think that we can't let, you know, let's, uh, let go of. Um, in terms of segregation, 
Um, that's another thing I want to talk about with some historical roots, but not necessarily in the 19th century. When we hear the word segregation, we all think of water fountains, lunch counters, schools, and public transportation. We assume it was largely defeated as a result of the Civil Rights Movement, right? But what if I were to tell you that residential segregation is far more insidious and persistent and destructive to entire life's choices, and that never went away. And it's becoming stronger every day, okay? It, the Civil Rights Movement did not put a dent in that. And it's gotten stronger since the Civil Rights Movement. Residential segregation is a relatively modern construction, and I, I won't bore you with all the details, but I'll just say that there were no ghettos in 19th century America, and not that ghettos are all bad, all ethnic groups have ghettos, it's just you know defined technically and academically as a neighborhood that's made up of a certain ethnic group, but there were none in the 19th century. Black Cincinnati's, Cincinnatians lived on every street, every block, every neighborhood, every ward, so don't think of that as having dated back to the 19th century. Um, but that didn't mean, just because there were no black ghettos in the 19th century didn't mean everything was peachy king. We know there was a lot of racial violence. But the appearance of segregation as a structural problem starts to become a problem as a result of the great migration of black people moving from rural areas to urban areas and from north to south, et cetera. It worsened with the creation of the federal highway program. Uh, specifically in Cincinnati, the construction of Highway 75, which raised a traditionally black middle-class neighborhood in West End. And uh, historian Lew Henry Lewis Taylor, no relation, found that 19,000 homes in the West End were destroyed, most of which were, uh, belonged to the black middle-class families. They were able to find homes in other parts of the city but the poor were not able to find housing that easily. So concentrated poverty became a thing even before we really had a word for it, you know, and that was a, as a result of it, um, of those forces I just told you about. There's a book I wanna refer you to, and I don't know him, I'm not gonna get a profit or a plug from it, but it's the book I use with my students. It's uh, Richard Rothstein uh, is his name, and, and uh, what is the name of that book? Um, what is the name of that book? Um, Color of Law, that's it, thank you. Yeah, so read that book and it'll tell you how residential segregation was created. Color of Law, Richard Rothstein, R-O-T-H-S-T-I-N. He also has, if you can't afford a book, never fear, he's got uh, documentaries on YouTube for free. So just really try to educate yourself about this. Segregation, he argues, his main thesis is that there is no real such thing as de facto segregation. It's not a real thing. Um, de facto, and we always believe that de jure segregation or segregation by law is different than de facto. We always were taught de facto happened, you know, we can't control that, right? It kind of happened as a result of economics. None of us could control that. He says, aha, segregation didn't happen by accident. All of it is de jure segregation. It was all deliberate, and it's all the direct result because of the individual racism of sellers and realtors, and the most important piece of this is the racist policies that create residential segregation, racist policies. What racist policies? The book describes them all. He talks about block, block, bust, block busting, which is when you exploit racial fears and get people to, oh, blacks are moving into the neighborhood. And they, oh, blacks are moving, we gotta sell our house. And then they sell their houses at a reduced price. And then the person goes in and buy, buys the houses. And that's block busting. Redlining, and that's when the homeowner's loan corporation uh, assessed mortgage default risk based on where homes were located. And so those uh, homes located in red-coated areas were at the highest risk, making it harder for potential buyers to get loans. In Cincinnati, Walnut Hills was a red zone. Avondale was a red zone. West End was a red zone. 
Okay. Another racist policy was racial zoning, um, and that was, I'm sorry, racial zooming, and that's limiting construction to sing single family homes to reduce the likelihood of poor black families moving in. Once upon a time, I'm ashamed to admit, I lived in Liberty Township, one of those fabricated communities, and they only had those types of homes out there. And so there were no affordable housing units, no apartment buildings. I was like, what kind of place is this? There, there can never be diversity, right? Because everybody has these $300,000 houses. I said, I gotta get out of here. And that's when I moved to Cincinnati. I said, this is like not normal. This is not healthy for my daughter. It's not healthy for me. Those types of places. Uh, steering is another one of these racist policies that Rothstein talks about. And this is when realtors just try to steer you away from certain neighborhoods. You, you all have heard about those. Restricted deeds and covenants where um, that's where basically uh, there are certain maybe housing uh, HOAs that uh, uh, restrict or prohibit the sale of homes to blacks. I mean, maybe you can't imagine that, but that was really done in the 50s and the 60s and the 40s. That's another racist policy. Uh, all of these tools and policies were used, and sometimes they're still being used in Cincinnati and its suburban towns and communities to keep neighborhoods and towns segregated or minimally integrated. Minimally integrated, okay? So now, living separately in ethnic neighborhoods, um, at, you know, as I told you, doesn't always have to be uh, a problem, but the problem in a racist society is that black ghettos always devolve, go downward, into slums because of state action or inaction. And so what do I mean by that? You will have unequal policing, maybe more policing, or maybe they don't come at all when there's crimes. Uh, lack of mun municipal services, maybe the gar garbage collector collection services aren't happening. You have devaluation of home values, poor infrastructure, de-incentivizing businesses from investing in those areas. All of this leads to housing insecurity, persistent racial wealth gaps, generational poverty. So it's because of this deliberate state action and not black culture that black neighborhoods devolve into slums. But the media and our own individual prejudiced view, prejudice views will have us believe that black people or their poor culture create slums. Should I say that again? Somebody said, one person said yes. But the media and our own prejudiced views will have us believe that black people, like there's something wrong with black people, or the culture of poor people is what create the slums. These ideas loom so large in our minds and our body politic that they prevent us off from acting. We start to think that black Cincinnatians deserve to live in dilapidated, substandard, bug-written housing, crime-written neighborhoods. This, these racist ideas prevent us from thinking a solution is possible. So no, residential segregation and concentrated poverty was not just purely about economics, as people purely believe. It was designed and these policies held it and hold it in place, okay? And so that's why organizations like HOME and NAACP and Urban League have fought, but they're not enough, obviously. They've done a lot, but it's not enough. It takes more than just a small, organ poorly and underfunded organization to do the work. It takes more of us actively doing the work. It's exhausting, and it's getting worse each decade, as I keep saying. Um, and so there are many ways we might um, combat these issues. We could talk about those later. And then the last big issue is maybe generational poverty. A lot of that is co co connected to the other thing I just talked about. Um, how do you build generational wealth if you're living in these, you know, uh, poor n neighborhoods and, and inheriting concentrated poverty? But we could look at uh, black poverty um, and connect it to occupational um, opportunities. 
And we know that maybe it doesn't all date back, you know, connect back to slavery, but we know there's something consistent about the lack of occupational diversity in Cincinnati for 200 years. There is something so wholly consistent that we can't say that it's just an accident. Okay, and what do I mean by that? Things that typically pull people out of poverty are education and skilled trades. We would all agree, right? We've heard the barriers to education in the city's earlier history. We know that the UC's founder, Charles McMicken, was a quite, a, quite a guy, right? <laughs> and African Americans never had that opportunity until very recently in the school's history. Now for the other path, skilled trades. When black men and women settled in the city, bringing the skills they had developed in slavery, they found that their white tradesmen would not allow them to practice those trades. So African-American blacksmiths, car carpenters, founders were hard pressed to find work. If, them, if an employer would hire them, they would be animated to violence, they might threaten to quit. So it was a deliberate and concerted effort to deny them the room to do their trades. So African-Americans were limited to menial labor jobs as janitors, washerwomen, street sweepers, boot shiners, ch chimney cleaners, dock workers. And a few men did manage to push through and become wealthy. We all know the story of Henry Boyd, the bedstead maker. But don't get confused. Henry Boyd, who initially wasn't allowed to do his trade either, he was a carpenter by trade. He had been a carpenter in slavery. He initially was a janitor when he got to the city. They wouldn't let him do his trade either. By, by luck, the guy that he was working for allowed him to work on a few projects and he was able to save some money and he eventually got enough money to own his own workshop or to buy his own workshop. And so then he do, did such exquisite work that his uh, bedsteads or bed frames were in high demand and that's how he was able to amass his wealth. But we would be remiss to believe that exceptions are the rules. You can't use that one example and say, well, look, he did it. Why couldn't they all do it? There was a, a structural problem that was preventing black men and women from, you know, uh, these occupational uh, diversity. We know that in the 20th century, um, and I'm skipping a lot of the stuff I have in the interest of time, in the 20th century in Cincinnati and beyond, for black women, the number one occupation was domestic worker and then nurses aides in the later half of the 20th century. Uh, I suspect that the latter may still hold true for the 21st century, nurses' aides. It's hard to crack through the iron walls of po poverty and the lack of occupational options as cleaning women or nurses' aides, okay? So this is how things get repeated or entrenched over time. These forces may feel daunting, unbreakable, hopeless, but what I respect and love about the spirit of this city is that Cincinnati, Cincinnatians didn't let it stop them. So here's to the good part, the happy part of the speech. So there are people who, in this city, there are examples of people who said there is no way that we can use existing capitalism to free ourselves from poverty. So in the past, um, this is just a story of people who just said the way to free ourselves from poverty is to go outside the capitalist structure. So in Over the Rhine, in the 1870s, there were radical socialist and communist solutions to poverty. Um, one American, African American, Peter Clark was among them, but there were many other people who joined this. And their critique of capitalism, or what they tried to lobby for, Number one, a uniform wage for all local government employees. Number two, to ensure that people were not ex charged exorbitant rates for essentials like housing and heating fuel. Sound familiar? Okay. So that was one solution that came out of this city. Communist and socialist solutions, not just Germans, but also black Americans tried that. Peter Clark said, government must stand as firmly for the rights of human humanity as it has stood for the rights of property, 
Peter Clark was just one of, he was one of only a few black men in this nation that was a part of that movement at that time in the 19th century. Uh, a movement that historians define as one of the most defining labor struggles in American history. And that was here in Cincinnati. So that's the moment like, wow, a black American in Cincinnati tried to figure out how to solve the problem of poverty. So yes, we all should be proud of that. There, were, there was another economic solution tried in this community that you should all be aware of, Cum communitarianism. And that was when uh, a few men got together in an organization called the Universal Brotherhood, and they believed that all personal wealth should be sacrificed for the good of improving the human condition. These were wealthy men. They said, let's give it all, pool the resources, and we all benefit out of this pool of money collectively. And so what we would call, and then we'll live together in these small communities, we'll produce goods that will benefit all of us collectively. This, we would call this a type of utopian socialism, or another word for it is communitarianism. So the goal of this type of philosophy was to eliminate greed, corruption, and inequality by reshaping and reorganizing society to move us away from capitalism. So in the fall of 1847, this universal brotherhood, which it wasn't just white men, it was white and black people, wealthy black men, uh, some of the wealthy black carpenters, uh, like J John P. Woodson was one of the black men that was involved. Um, they got, uh, got together, moved to Claremont County, and they built uh, common buildings, and they built their community. Unfortunately, it didn't last, but it, what a radical vision. Again, out of the minds of Cincinnatians. Another thing that was really special, women's rights activism. Also kind of pushed to a radical level by your Cincinnatians. Uh, the 19th century was considered radical for women to speak about certain topics in public. So when Lucy Stone started shining a light on old, white, wealthy rapists who impregnated women against their wishes long before the Me Too movement, it was, she was quite a piece of work. A longtime advocate of women's rights, uh, including women's financial and personal independence within marriage, I mean, I think she would be like my best friend if, if I knew her. So she didn't believe women should be, um, you know, depending on their husbands, and she's like, we need to do prenups. She was really ahead of her time. Um, but she, was, uh, she believed that women should determine when and how they would become mothers, okay? So she was really ahead of her time. She was also an abolitionist, and she took exception to sexual abuse within slavery. So during the hearing for Margaret Garner, the, the case you all know about, I wrote about her, uh, if you hadn't, this woman marched into a federal courtroom and accused Margaret Garner's owner of rape and fathering her children. Such an accusation of rape, an interracial rape against a powerful white slaveholder was profoundly radical and risky in 1856. At a time when women weren't allowed to discuss these issues, she dared to do it. Her courageous solidarity with a powerless woman of color shows us what allies could be doing today. Um, Stone, though, didn't make it about her or her activism. She made it about Margaret's bodily autonomy. As an enslaved woman, uh, Margaret Garner had no say about who would forcibly uh, enter her body or when or how often, and she couldn't control if she became pregnant as a result or if, even if she could bring those pregnancies to term. White owners made all of those decisions. No one would ever expect that in 2022, we would still be discussing women's bodily autonomy vis-a-vis -vis powerful white men, but here we are. For those who want to use the legal uh, machinery to dismantle injustice, there are powerful examples for you. Attorneys, white attorneys like John Jolliffe and Salmon Portland Chase, I'm so in love with Salmon Portland Chase. <laughs> they used their legal careers at a time when it wasn't popular to do so. Um, and they decided, they made a decision to represent fugitive slaves 
and they used their legal uh, brilliance to try to undo the laws of slavery. They did this in the most pro-slavery city in the North, right here in Cincinnati, and they did it for free. Fugitive slaves didn't have any money. African Americans uh, named Sam and Portland Chase the Attorney General for uh, Fugitive Slaves for his work. Both he and Jola suffered great condemnation from their own communities for working on behalf of African Americans. This was a pro-slavery city, okay? So they're doing this work, so it, it was hard to do. Jola, for example, was beaten with a cowhide whip by an owner in Kentucky for defending a fugitive slave in Ohio. Chase, who began his career as a debt attorney, believed in the freedom of the poorest, most powerless, and unprotected people. He was rewarded by the universe. So this is an example of you can take a lot of risks to maybe work in criminal justice reform, take these risks, and he was rewarded by the universe for that. He became a governor, a senator, and a Supreme Court justice. Chase understood that unjust laws needed champions. They needed to be challenged to make our democracy stronger. We need those who are willing to use their legal careers in service of justice today. So I've gone over my time. I won't tell you the other stories, but I'll say these stories that I've shared are just a small representation of Cincinnati's activist history. May the historical roots increase your empathy and understanding of this community and why it's persisting and why this history is so entrenched in this cycle where we can't you know, get out of this cycle of repeating the things from the past. Use this history to be informed as a social justice activist. Only then, only then can you transform this city, the state, the nation, and the world. And only then will you walk into the pages of history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all, and thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, if you have questions, we do have a little time for questions, so raise your hand. I will bring you the microphone so that the people online and everyone in the auditorium can hear you. Okay, Mr. Warren has the first question. Well, I just wanted to bring to your attention that uh, just two blocks from the Harry Beecher Stowe House, there's a new historic marker uh, honoring Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell. Wow! And you're on kidding. the walking tours that we give in the Walnut Hills neighborhood that start at the Harriet Beecher Stowe House, I would say that's the most popular spot. Oh my goodness! Are you kidding? Who did the work to get it's that the, marker? Do you know the name? It's the National. Um, it's Stone. it's the National Votes for Women Trail, and the um, it was spearheaded. Right, so it's the Pomeroy Foundation, the National Votes for Women Trail, and the one that spearheaded the effort here in Cincinnati to get a total of three markers. So it is Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell, also um, Cassidy Davis, what's her first name? Uh, the, the one that did the, the um, Let Women Vote suffrage posters, and then the third one, the publisher. Okay, well, at, at any rate, there are three National Votes for Women trail markers here in wow. Cincinnati now. Yes, including Lucy Stone. Well, thanks to <laughs> whoever did the work to, to get those, especially the one on Lucy Stone. Catherine Durack, who is okay. a, a historian here and, and worked at Miami University, she kind of spearheaded wow. that effort here. Wow. Dr. Anderson, are you raising your hand? And if we're talking about historical markers, not too far away from those markers in Walnut Hills is a new Ohio marker for the, for the local um, Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Wow. They, they bought a mansion, paid it off within 30 years. Many of these women were the women you talked about who cleaned houses. Right. Who raised funds. Oh my goodness. To, send, to help children go to yes. school. 
They ran the home for elderly colored women. Yes. They put a new roof on the home um, for older colored men. So they were that, really- Yes, they're significant in black are. women's history and in US history, yes. Right? Yeah, they Thank were part you. of the National Council. Wow, I'm so proud of this community. Here's a question here. All right, here, I'm coming. How's? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Angela Pearson. I happened to go to Blink uh, this past weekend, and on one of the buildings, it had um, a little Africa. So I said, little Africa? What the heck is that? So I went to the library and uh, pulled up some information on it, and I was very disturbed about Little Africa. And then I went into a historian, uh, Chris Hemlet, and he told me a little bit about um, uh, Little Africa. So it's said uh, in the 21st century that our children in the public schools is not learning. Yeah. Nothing about this history that should yeah. be told. This is rich history. It's very rich. And, and it's said that we are left in the dark. I know nothing, and I'm trying to learn yeah. about my history and, and how far we came, yeah. you know, with, with segregation. Yes. You know, and, and it's said, and to me, it seemed like our society wanted to push us back to Jim Crow mm -hmm. and Reconstruction period because of no one is speaking up about uh, what's going on with housing and yeah. this city, it's Cincinnati around the country. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think it's terrible because right now I feel like that we are in segregation because oh, the housing yeah. are running like $300,000 yeah. in my neighborhood I grew up in. Yeah. And it's sad because yeah. a lot of African Americans can't afford it. It's been pushed out of their own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now they back pushing it again. Yeah. What do they want from us? That's yeah. all I ask. Yeah. What do they want? And there's a lot of Europeans live in a city, know what's going on, no one's speaking up. Nobody's speaking up, yeah. Why? But they come to these meetings. Yeah. And you wanna and you know the truth. Mm -hmm. But you hold your head down in shame. Yeah. But no one want to talk about it. That's why they want to put the critical race theory in school to eliminate the little percent of history that we know about. Yeah. We are human beings like everybody else. Yeah. And we want the same. We want equality. We don't want inequality, social inequality. Mm -hmm. We don't. We tired of that. We tired of social inequality. How far? How much we have to stay on our knees? to say that we want the same thing, we're human beings. And mm -hmm. I want to leave this note. After I started taking black history class, I never knew that all race of people come from out of Africa. All race of people come out of Africa. And it said how we, only certain sec section of people are being mistreated. Yeah. My foreparents have put labor in this country and been mistreated. Yeah. And it's sad today we still being mistreated. Yeah. The signs, they, the signs are still there, but they just got them turned backwards. Turn those signs around so y'all can see reality. That's all I got to say. Wow, you're. <laughs> I really appreciate your comments, um, just the raw emotions of them. Uh, nearly almost brought me to tears. Um, you're absolutely right about just the deliberate attempts to suppress the history. Um, I, one of the things that was so heartbreaking when I lived in Cincinnati is that, you know, I gifted my entire academic career to this city with three books, killed my career. It was hard for me to get out of University of Cincinnati. Um, because I had written so much about this city. And the reason why, I was just trying to get the attention of Cincinnatians. And before I left, nobody really was asking me to do lectures except for this church. Nobody. I remember picking up the phone to call Clark Montessori High School to ask, can I come talk about my second book, which was about the guy who the school is named after? 
And they were like, yeah, we're not interested. I was like, what? And I remember when the Freedom Center, uh, Carl Westmoreland, who has sacrificed his entire life trying to, as one man who's outside of the academy, he's a lay historian, just tr trying to talk and educate people. He's one man trying to like educate everybody. And, um, and he worked to get that building put on the ground where Little Africa was. You know, so the Freedom Center is on soil that has significance to Little Africa, right? And most people don't know that. Most Cincinnatians don't know that. And I think that's the saddest thing ever. And I, that's why I said, I was talking to my family, I said, yeah, this is my last talk in Cincinnati because this is a little, it's a little sad. Like, it's not working. I've, I've, my whole career has been spent on this city. Nobody's paying attention except maybe you guys in this room. And so I'm done. This is my last talk. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you should start having maybe in your churches or your community centers, um, you know, after school programs, smaller his black history clubs or, you know, and so I try to do that. Um, there are a few high schools that, uh, you know, would bring me in for small events. Like my daughter started a black culture club at Walnut, and so she brought me in because, you know, she, I'm her mother. <laughs> It wasn't because the school wanted me there. It was because she wanted me there. And um, I think, but you know, it can happen. Um, and I don't want you all to feel as hopeless as I kind of, it's just that I've spent so many decades of my career and it just, it, the hunger wasn't there by black or white people. I'm glad you're coming into this, um, but we ha I don't know how to get it so that it's everywhere um, other than maybe pushing the public schools to do at it a little bit more. They were doing it a little bit when I was leaving Cincinnati, uh, doing it in their teachers' institutes and stuff. They would bring me in to talk about Ohio history. But um, don't, don't give up. Just keep fighting. This is your community. You're still living here. I can't give up because I don't live here anymore. But uh, don't give up, Cincinnatian. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's not what my history uh, in, 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 in white American schools institution, they misinformed me. Yeah. About well, Carter energy. G. Woodson, you all should read this book by, it's called The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. And it talks about the miseducation. We all have suffered miseducation in schools. And so, um, yeah, these are all painful conversations. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Taylor. Hi. Bryn Thomas, fangirl historian. <laughs> Bryn, hey! I just wanted to, like, Cincinnati school teacher at the School of Performing Arts. She and I are, have been in, <laughs> she's one of the few. She writes to me, and all her students read my books, right? And I, <laughs> the students are here, thank you, hi! So I, I understand that you would feel um, the way that you do, so I, I don't wanna discredit that, but just know that black history is taught yeah. as an elective in every high school in this city. Wow, Cincinnati's yes. black history? Okay. No, black history. In Black general, history, okay. And we work together at the district to try to bring in local history. Good. And I hope that you'll reconsider coming back because you're such a gem <laughs> and so meaningful to this community. No, you're such a gem. You're such a gem. This woman has been in cons. How, how long have I known you? About four or five years. And, and she writes to me, and I've sent her e -P PDFs of the book because I don't want the students to have to pay for it. 
and, and it's, it's like a real like sisterhood. And, um, and I'm just so grateful for the work that she does at uh, School of Performing Arts and that she brought her students here. Thank you for the, being in the trenches for our community. Yeah. Hi, I'm Bob Wallace. I teach at Northern Kentucky University. And I use your Margaret Garner book in my Frederick Douglass in Cincinnati course. Thank you. And I think those of us who are concerned about making progress now, there is a lot to admire in the 1850s in what yeah. both blacks and whites did accomplish. Mm -hmm. And when Delaney came to analyze this city for Frederick Douglass's paper in mm -hmm. 1848, mm -hmm. he found that there were more middle-class blacks working in the trades than in any other city he'd been to. And he found there were more uh, black young women working profitably than in any other city he'd been to. And at the same time, we had um, a very strong anti-slavery uh, yeah. community with uh, Sarah Ernst and William Blackwell and Henry Blackwell, and, and they were kind of the base for when, um, when uh, the other, when, um, I'm forgetting her name right now, you're a great hero in mine too. Um, Eliza Lucy, Patterson. when Lucy oh, Stone Lucy came Stone. in, they had built up a very strong uh, mixed race anti-slavery community and, yeah. and were national leaders in having open discussion about slavery that was not happening elsewhere. So while it was very depressing in many ways, when I see the faith these black and white people had yeah. in the 1850s, which looked absolutely impossible, um, and when things managed to change in 10 years, uh, it's pretty inspiring. But then it seems like after the Civil War, uh, a lot of that progress got lost. And that yeah. is very sad to see. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I don't know if we should um, maybe overestimate the, the progress of the 1850s. I don't think it is like maybe Philadelphia, you know, in terms of um, uh, black progress or even New York or other cities, but certainly, because of the environment, what they were able to accomplish, especially the interracial cooperation, which was very necessary for blacks in this space. I mean, it was absolutely necessary that they had uh, black, uh, uh, I'm sorry, white allies um, in everything that they did. It was necessary in, in this area. I think you're, you're absolutely right, and, and it definitely reveals the possibilities for allyship between blacks and whites. Um, but you know, you know, this is also the place where there's still, you know, racial violence happening uh, on the shores in the 1860s with the black, the impressment of those black men, you know, during the Civil War. So all of those things, like you have these hopes, but then these other things keep also re reappearing. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of a mixed bag, you know. But definitely, you know, we could definitely look at it as glass half full, or, you know. Oh, okay. Dr. Taylor, thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you for your book. I've recommended it so many times, oh, I can't thank even you. tell you. <laughs> um, I research and write on 19th century, especially antebellum Cincinnati. Oh, really? Yes, I do. I'm Thanks. the person with the journal that had the girl that watched the banjo player, and you had talked with me about oh. it on our last meeting. My question is, you had mentioned the, about ghettos in Cincinnati in the 19th century. Could you elaborate on Bucktown and how you look at Bucktown as perhaps being something other, as maybe a district instead of an actual ghetto? Yeah, I'm just using Henry Louis Taylor's uh, definition of ghettos, he, uh, you know, in sociologists' uh, definitions, but he talks about residential clusters, and that's how he phrases the term. So there were, um, they were on, you know, clusters of black people, maybe certain clusters in Little Africa and in Bucktown, um, but, uh, you know, they weren't the majority of people in those areas. So it wasn't like the neighborhood at 6th and Broadway was predominantly black. It was just that a lot of blacks lived there, you know, a significant portion of blacks lived there, but it still wasn't mostly black. So it wasn't a black neighborhood, but a, a lot of black institutions were located there, but it didn't make it a neighborhood that was like black in that sense. And so Henry Louis Taylor in his book, Race in the City, 
kind of distinguishes um, what those cities were, or I'm sorry, what those neighborhoods were. And so that's what I go by. I, I totally looked at those areas and I did my own analysis um, by using the census on a house by house basis. And he's right, there's a lot of whites and blacks living in the same house, uh, a lot of blacks and whites in the same neighbor, uh, I'm sorry, the same buildings on the same blocks next door to each other. So that's why I say I couldn't really call it a black neighborhood, um, or how we would define it in our 20th and 21st century uh, definitions of a ghetto or you know, a black neighborhood. So that's all I mean. But yes, they have those pejoratives. I think any time a neighborhood gets to have a significant uh, number of black people, and I don't know what number that is, there's a point at which it gets typecast as a black neighborhood, even if that's not really what it is numerically. And I think that's why people had the perception that it was that. But when you look at the census data on a, and I did it painstaking research, and it just doesn't bear out that it was a black neighborhood. So. Okay. Uh, thank you for your very provocative and well-meaning commentary. Thank you. Uh, I'm retired from Northern Kentucky University. Okay. Uh, and uh, I just want to caution those of us in this room who are truly committed to social justice and social change that we think carefully about what we might equate with substantive social change. I very much appreciate the comments I heard here today about markers being placed all around the city. And by the way, there's one of Marion Spencer in the Smale Park downtown. Yeah. I and I drive around Cincinnati and I see all of these paintings in black communities from the get bottom the of the building to the yeah. very top. And I just want to be just caution us that we don't equate that kind yeah. of public display I love it. with substantive social change. Yeah. As my uh, good friend Dr. Wallace just commented, yeah. some of what we might define as change of yeah. 100 years ago yeah. seems to have retrogressed. Yes. So, what, so what I'd like us to continue to focus on is the fact that I recently heard on the news report just a couple of days ago that there's talk in Cincinnati of $200 million being committed to the renovation of the convention center while, as you just stated, the poverty rate of African Americans in Cincinnati is still 39%. So I don't want us to get too far ahead of ourselves. I, I think your comments are absolutely right. We don't want anybody, uh, and I don't know if the, the people didn't necessarily mean that, but um, I don't want anybody to be left with this idea that we're equating uh, markers and memorials as social justice. We mean equality. Like how do we turn the skip, uh, tip the scales of this kind of vast concentrated black poverty and criminal uh, uh, justice rates where black people are being overly incarcerated and overly policed and, and killed by police and, and undereducated. How do we get more of them into colleges? That's what we mean. And we mean how do we close the racial wealth gap if, if black people are concentrated in these neighborhoods where people are actively devaluing their properties. And then when you have a neighborhood like over the Rhine that quickly, almost over the night, gentrify, and then you haven't done anything to address affordable housing, and you've displaced communities, and then they're not even the people who used to live there don't work in these beautiful new shops. They're beautiful, but what about employing some of these people? So that's what we mean about social justice. Um, it's, it's, it's messy work, it's hard work. It means, it might mean we have to sue the city or the state to, uh, you know, for underinvesting in some of these schools. We may have to sue uh, some of these real estate agencies. I think that's been done before. I think Sipsy Klein was sued successfully um, and, and, you know, for the policies that they've done. Um, and not that lawsuits are always, you know, the thing, but you might have to rethink your economic system. That's why I gave you this um, 
you know, in the past people have used, you know, considered socialism or even communitarianism. You might have to rethink whether or not capitalism is part of the problem, you know? And so, you know, that, that, that's what we mean about, like, to really solve difficult problems that 200 or 200 years deeply entrenched in the fabric of our city, we have to have just really different solutions that are painful and uncomfortable. And, and that's what we mean. How, how do we uh, uh, reinvest uh, the city's resources into some of these neighborhoods that have never had any critical investments, ever at all, ever at all. And so, yeah, that's what it means. It means all of this hard stuff that uh, very few of us are willing to do. So, go ahead. And my question sort of goes to what you were just talking about in terms of what you've seen historically in our time now, what potential solutions or, I, or ideas do you see as most ripe to be taken up and to be championed and to move things forward? Well, I think, like I said, there, there has to be, um, you know, uh, there ha how Ohio in general, I don't, one of the things that pained me was how Ohio funds its schools. I think it creates problems and systemic inequality that it's really hard to get, you know, since schools are so important to us becoming successful, then we have to get at that. I think we have to maybe do some type of reparations for the wealth problems, the unequal wealth that has happened and, and people's houses are being devalued and neighborhoods are being raised to make way for uh, highways. There has to be reparations and a reckoning for that wealth that has been lost in the black community. Um, these are very pro provocative and probably not popular things, but you know, professors tend to be a little bit out there. Um, and I'm no different. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that things like that, and I don't mean slavery reparations, I mean reparations for 20th century injuries that were done on this community here in Cincinnati by the city of Cincinnati and the state of Ohio. That's what I mean. I mean dismantling this two-party state solution. Like, I just look, I said, what? Are we still really only talking about Democrats and Republicans here? These people have been in power back and forth, one party or the next, and nothing's changed for black people. In any of these, whether Peter Clark, I can't used to keep using him again, all of his ideas were just out there. He, he third party uh, activism, I know that it doesn't always work, but it at least is a different idea and building coalitions politically with other people who have different ideas that are just not the typical, this is the democratic, this is what we believe in, this is what Republicans believe in. Let's partner with people who might believe a little bit what, you know, some little Republican policies, and they might believe in some socialist policies or some libertarian policies, but we all believe in social justice when it relates to, to the racial wealth gap. We all believe in that in common, but what opportunities do any of, we never have these really substantive political debates in our communities anymore. They did in the 19th century all the time. Things got a little heated, but they did the hard intellectual work. We're not willing to do it. We just look at people's platform, oh, he believes in this, I, I voted for him. You gotta do the hard intellectual work and it's hard, it's messy. And, and, and so, so that's another thing we have to do. Uh, not all of our solutions are political. Most of them are not. Um, but we all tend to think all of our solutions are political. All of our solutions to so, you know, social problems are political. Well, if you go vote for this party, then, then you know, things will get better. It never gets better, no matter which party. <laughs> So that, I mean, at some point we have to say, well, maybe there is no political solution to black inequality, right? What do the rest of you all think? What are your radical ideas? 
Somebody has yeah. an idea. What's your radical idea? Stand up and boom your voice. Okay. Well, I think one of the things that I, I think you're right, like during the civil rights movement, the activists kind of understood that it's hard to even think about activism if you're hungry. We kind of ignore that part of it. You, it's hard to go march somewhere or sit in somewhere if you're hungry. And so, yeah, you have to like address the, 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 the food uh, insecurities. Food insecurities are worse than we all think because that's something we tend to keep a little private. But um, yeah, these solutions I think come from your own communities. I think uh, cooperative economics might be something that works as well, but it, it would take people who have resources sacrificing those resources for something better, for the good of the whole. I don't think people really want to do that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Maybe sorry. I have a, a, go a, ahead. a radical suggestion. Uh, how, do, how do you, the black community, feel about well-intentioned uh, white people moving into very segregated black neighborhoods? I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, I don't okay. have a problem with it. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that's also, uh, what do the rest of you all think? I mean, I just looked at a house in a, a black a street with all black residents. Yeah. And I wonder how I'd be uh, accepted moving yeah, into I, that neighborhood. I'm looking at, you know, from that perspective. There's a lady behind you that has something to say. Oh, here. Yeah, right. My, my question would be, why did you move there? Because, uh, you know, I'm a resident of the West End. I've lived in the West End. I'm not from Cincinnati originally, but I've always lived in the West End probably for over almost 20, 22 years now. And to see how my neighborhood has just completely changed. Uh, and it's predominantly, in the area I live in, it's predominantly uh, older white folk who are moving in from the suburbs because they're no longer afraid of segregated school or having their kids go to school with black people. The kids are out of school, so they're empty nesters. And um, they want to be in town now. So, you know, my question would be, why are you moving in? Uh, and, and not you personally, but, but that's something I'm sure the African-American neighbors you have are wondering and probably wondering when are the other white people coming? Because that's typically, there's, there's a pattern. So many in Cincinnati, I'm shocked living on the East Coast since I went to college and coming home to see them um, because I've lived in Washington, Boston, New York, Chicago. I mean, I'm just shocked at the level of segregation in Cincinnati. So, um, but it would seem to me that there is long term a purpose mm -hmm. in not having exclusively black neighborhoods. Yeah, that's what I was, that's you know, what I was talking I mean, about. Yeah. That attitude amongst black people ultimately undercuts. Yeah. the move for integrated Cincinnati. Well, I think what, I think maybe what her, um, see, yeah. I yeah, I think it's gentrification is maybe what they're 
afraid of. So it's not just that you live there. Well, she says what your intentions are. So right. I was, I'm a gentrifier in DC. Not because, and you're like, wait, you're black. But I'm upper class, and I'm not from DC, and I can afford a half a million dollar property. And people are like, yeah, you shouldn't be here, and they don't like me there. And I get it, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's a sensitive thing. Because I have pushed the values up, but I have also made it impossible for them to hold on to their homes because their tax base goes up, their house has increased in value, but now they can't afford their taxes. So, because, no, 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 it's the tax, how the, the it, this happened in Harlem. Right, so the taxes go up on the houses. Why? Why necessarily? Well, because of the policies that. No, no, no. The policy. Yeah, yeah. The remodeling. You've paid a higher amount. Maybe you got a newer place. Right. Uh, uh, wow. Yeah, or in my case, I was able to purchase at a higher price point. And so now all the people here, maybe their house values went up, which all sounds great, until you get to a little grandmother that's on a fixed income, and her taxes just went up. Now she can't afford to stay in her house. So that's a problem. Now she's been displaced. Now another gentrifier will be in her place. So that's where the resentment comes in. And it's like, it's like really, a mix, it's like, you know, you have to have a conscience when you're doing these things. You want a nice place, right? I want this and I want, uh, you know, this stainless steel appliances and I want this and I want, you know, an attached garage or whatever you want. But it, it sometimes it, you know, pushes all the values up when you buy at a, a much higher price point or you renovate at a much higher, and your property value goes up, then the people who are there now can't even afford the, the, the higher valuation and it then forces them out. That happened in, that's happening in Harlem. The, the traditional, original black ghetto is now no longer really all that black. Okay, uh, well, it's, 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 it's not so much a question, but I know you, one of your statements was what radical social, yeah. I've always wondered why we don't get our kids off the buses and bring them back to their neighborhood schools and make our neighborhood schools gyms yeah. where recreation, where they're open from morning to evening. Yeah. When they get out of school, there's tutorial programs. Yeah. There's things for their parents to do. Our kids are riding the bus mm -hmm. for hours. That's, that's a real problem. Yeah. I think we need to address it by bringing schools back to our mm -hmm. community and letting us go there. Right. Oh, we have so many questions. All right, it, it, we're gonna have to like limit discussion to just Why? a couple more. This okay, is, well, it, as long as you're okay. Yeah, I don't wanna, let I don't it wanna, Okay, Tony wanted to say something and I'll come here next. One of the problems that I see in Cincinnati, I moved to Walnut Hills and it, 26 years ago, mm -hmm. and it was mainly a, an African-American mm -hmm. neighborhood at the time, mm -hmm. but I liked the particular place that had been built. It was one of the first places that had you know, been built mm -hmm. newer, and I was looking to downsize. What I've seen, having been on the board of the area council and president of it in the past, is that my neighbors, and it's not just my African and Na American neighbors, it's my neighbors who have been here a long time mm -hmm. are now worried because what has happened, people like me moved in, we loved the neighborhood, told other people how great the neighborhood wow. was. Other people moved in because they liked the fact the neighborhood was integrated and yeah. had a different vibe to it and it was close to downtown. So it became popular. Then the developers started coming. 
before they came, we couldn't get developers. We changed the streets. Once the developers came, the city and the state uses something, well, we use something called AMI. And they use the county AMI to determine in the city. And so our neighborhood doesn't compare with the county AMI. So developers come in and say, oh, well, we're, we're building 80% of AMI. It's affordable housing. Well, it's affordable for people maybe that live in High Park mm -hmm. or maybe that live in, in out in the suburbs, right. but it's not affordable for the inner city for the people who want to stay there yeah. or for the people who want, they're the working middle class yeah, that's, that's people. Awful. The teachers, the bus drivers, the postman, people like that who have jobs, yeah. but they can't afford a half million dollar house. Yeah. And yet we're being told that's 80% of AMI. So this is a problem in yeah. the city itself. That, that policy has to be attacked. That's, you guys have to work to get rid of that policy, right? Yes, during my research and study, mm -hmm. when I read about Malcolm X, when he made assertion that African American was better off being segregated than integrated. Mm -hmm. And as I read the history, I kind of acquiesce with him. And the reason why is because when black people really did have real community, black communities, we're going to take the Black Wall Street in Oklahoma. See, if we did go back to segregation, our community would not be safe from y'all. Y'all would burn them down again. Like they burned and destroyed all of our black communities was destroyed. Why, as I read, because they excel. We, our dollars stayed in our community and gave us economic development and economic growth. It didn't go into white communities like it's doing today. That's what's killing our neighborhood. So by our dollars staying in there monetarily, they were able to produce and grow and do everything and excel white communities, which they did not like that. So they created a story, said a black man raped a white woman. They tried to find all kind of negative things what a black man has done, accuse him of, and they destroyed our black neighborhood. Oh yeah, that we is need to work yeah. together. That's why it's not safe for us to become segregated again, because I feel like they would do it again. So they give us an opportunity. And I want to say this: I used to enjoy standing up and pledge allegiance to the flag. When I read and I look at the definition of indivisible one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Guess what? Indivisible means united. We are inseparable. This country is divisible, which means divided. We're not together at all. We still been suffering with your laws and policies that you have in place. We have not been that far from slavery, if you look at it. All I'm just saying is, I have white friends, like white would say they have black friends, and I get along with anybody. But this world and this city got to change. Otherwise, it's not going to be the same eventually. Because when you fence a person in too long, they're going to bust out of that fence. And we don't want that. We want peace. We want equality. We're tired of inequality, social inequality. We want what everybody, because guess what? Black tax dollars was put into this city like everybody else's dollars. And we still get stepped on. Everything that we have to purchase today in this city, we have to go to white communities and buy everything for our subsistence, our food, our water, our clothing, everything. We have to go to your community and y'all, our dollars are going to y'all communities and giving y'all economic development. Well, ours is still in poverty, but now y'all want it back, so now we're getting pushed out again. That's all I got to say. I hope one day 
Everybody look at that American flag, I pledge allegiance to the flag. It does not pertain to me. Until I see a big transition in this country, I would never stand up and salute that American flag because it don't pertain to me, nor does it pertain to my people because my father fought in the Korean War like everybody else. And my father was upset with this country. You know why? Because he said to me, he said he was over there fighting the same war as white soldiers. And he over there, they over there dying the same way. He said, but when they could not even sleep in the same bunk with the same white soldiers. And they over there fighting and he looked back, his people had to drink out the same, could not drink out the same water fountain. Couldn't sit in the same restaurant. And he said when they captured their enemy, their enemy was sleeping in the same bunk with the white soldiers. All I'm just saying is, America, we're not that far. We haven't changed that much. Just the sign has turned backwards. All I'm just saying is, I thank everybody here who's came, and I thank you, <laughs> Arthur, for your book. And you have just woke me up even further <laughs> to learn more <laughs> about my history. They, tell it. they don't tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth. Wow, well your, your hurt and your trauma are, are palpable and I appreciate your honesty. And um, the one thing I would say, I want us all to just understand that there are two, two terms that I want us to like le understand. I want to just maybe make sure we get. There are two terms, segregation and separation. They're not necessarily the same, right? So when we say we want segregation back, maybe no. Segregation is bad. Separate is different. So I teach at a black school, and I don't consider Howard a segregated school. Does anybody know the difference between a separate school and a segregated school, or a black separate community and a segregated community? Because I don't want us to leave here thinking they're the same. Okay, that's part of it, but not all. I would say segregation is a tool of white supremacy. Oh, very good. Segregation is a tool of white supremacy, state action, and a state-sponsored inferiority, state-sponsored inequality. And so when black people, we don't say we want to live in a segregated neighborhood. None of us do. But sometimes we want black neighborhoods because sometimes there can be peace in black environments. Sometimes there can be love in black environments, safety, uh, psychological safety in black environments. Sometimes you can build up your students in the way that you need to in black environments. Sometimes you can empower your black students in the way they need to be empowered in black environments. So that's what I think you meant. You're looking for black environments and not segregated environments, right? So we, we don't want segregation, none of us do. But black environments have always been a solace and a some source of comfort and, and radical black love. Um, and so that's why sometimes, I mean, to, to white people, maybe you don't understand why sometimes we want it and sometimes we don't, is because they're, they're, they're different things for us. Uh, black separateness versus black segregation or segregation versus just us wanting to be together at our own churches or our own schools or, you know, and there's um, a lot of joy when we're with each other because we can talk about racism like how this sister did and just not fear anything in those spaces. And so I, I don't want you to leave here. I just wanted to correct uh, a lot of misunderstandings that I was hearing. I said, I, I, I gotta correct it. Um, is that I want you to leave here thinking, oh, Dr. Taylor said we gotta, you know, she said segregation was okay. So we can go back to segregating black people. <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't like segregate. We don't want it. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, that's a lot of people in the civil rights era were opposed to busing, that kind of 
uh, to try to, you know, for integration's sake, we'll take the black kids. There's always black kids being bust. Um, usually not the reverse, um, but uh, yeah, a lot of people had that same argument that it just takes so much time to, in the transportation. And so how can we, if our neighborhoods are so segregated and we go back to neighborhood schools, then our kids will come to college. They'll come to me having never been around black people. Like when I got them at Cincinnati, they mm -hmm. never been around black people. And I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> but that's because our neighborhoods are how they are. And so they're just things that they didn't know. These are the white kids that you see. Just things they didn't know about the world because they had never been around black people. Right. Or Latinos. I'm just like, what? So that's what I said. We all are held back. Even those kids weren't as cosmopolitan. They weren't as sharp and aware as they have been at other schools I've taught all around the country. They just weren't. And that's why I said, that kind of thing that we do in our neighborhoods has hurt everybody. It's stifled even the progress of white kids. That's why we need to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's not just so oh, we have to do it for, I don't want you to leave here. Oh, for black people's sake, we gotta do better. No, we need to do better for your grandkids' sake. So it got to me and I just was like, oh my God, what? What in the world? <laughs> They've never been around black people. Yeah. They don't know why black people do X, Y, Z. You know, and, and it's just like things that you just learn from just having had a conversation with black people. And they hadn't done it. They're from, oh, I'm from this part of Ohio, this part. I Like, you're my first per black person I've really talked to. I said, you got to be kidding. This is not good. Like, because you're old. You're 18. So that's what's happening in Ohio schools, K through 12, um, and a lot of other parts of Ohio. So um, these issues have to be combated, uh, not just Cincinnati. I'm not just saying only Cincinnati. Um, I went to segregated schools in Toledo until I got to high school, and many of you did too. Uh, some of you went to Hughes when it was all white, right? Yeah. Right. And so yeah, we know. Some of you went to Hughes when it was all black. Yes. Yes? See? But none of you went to Hughes when it was integrated. <laughs> I didn't hear any yeses. I'm just saying. Uh, Dr. Taylor, I so appreciate you and your Thank research. You. You. I don't know who gave you the impression they didn't care about your research, but it wasn't me. Y'all. <laughs> it, it was us. all y'all. Except we, for we, her. We, and her, we, we yeah. love it. And you. you were talking about Cincinnati Public Schools, and I've been doing some research on a book I'm working on, hey. and it's quite interesting that Dr. Jenny Porter started Stowe School, and she was the fourth, I think the fourth black woman in the United States of mm -hmm. America. To have to her get, own school. Yeah, and to, to get a PhD. Yeah, to get her PhD And, and too. when I worked in public relations at UC, her, um, what do you call that final thing that you get for your doctorate? Her thesis, yes. <laughs> is requested more than yeah. any other oh. thesis at yeah, the she University was a big, of Cincinnati. She was a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I wonder if you could uh, speak to that education part. And you reminded me of that book. I don't know if it's the right title, but why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Oh, yeah, yeah. And that would answer some of the, exactly. <laughs> some of the questions here. And, I, and my last thought, but I'll ask you later. Uh, Tell me about the more about the book you're working on now, where you're talking about females and slavery, and and I'm just intrigued by that. I know you can't give too much away, but thank you. I, I actually can, and I do, because again, I, you know, we get what like seventy cents a book. I don't care. I like I tell you guys, I'll send you the books for free. I don't get anything from the books. I will send them for free. I'll give you my books. But like I don't. I'm not one of those types of people, so I'll tell you about the book. But Jenny Porter is um, a carryover from the 19th century. She, uh, Cincinnati's black community, unlike all the other communities in, in Ohio, 
they resisted integrating their schools. Did you all know that? Yeah. And not because they didn't, but it looks really unprogressive on the surface. Like, what is wrong with those black people? What's wrong with them? But it's because they, there was something so special happening inside of their schools that they didn't want to lose it. The things that I talked to you about, they were grooming these powerful black leaders, people like uh, Jenny and, um, you know, and, and Peter Clark and others. And so um, she just, that same model, she kind of like replicated in a way, right? And so she met with a lot of resistance for opening her school at that moment in the early 20th century because that wasn't a time. Black people had pretty much settled the issue. Yeah, no, integration is the thing that the community is for. We don't believe in those all black anything anymore. And so she went back to this era um, for, that, that black Cincinnati had done in the 19th century and her schools were powerful and she had the kind of success and outcomes that was just unparalleled in the country, not just in Cincinnati. And so that's why people were going to her dissertations. They're trying to see how do we inspire black students? Teachers are trying to figure that out. How do we galvanize them? How do we wake up their minds so that they can you know, uh, do more than just the regular things? And so Jenny Porter had a lot of the answers to that. So that's why she matters. Do you all know who this is? Hold your book up. This woman, let me tell you, she's a historian Gina, too. She's written this book. Gina Ruffin Moore, who's on the Harry Potter Stowe House board. She has, she brought this book to give me. Show your book again. Let me tell you a funny story. She's like, Dr. Taylor, I brought you my book. I said, you gave it to me two other times. <laughs> Maybe she can give it to somebody else. I said, I got two of the same copy, and she, she signed it both times. So I said, she had wondered if I remembered her. I said, do you remember me is the question. Because she gave me the book twice. But uh, my, my uh, last book, which um, will be out soon, is called Brooding Over Bloody Revenge. Brooding is a 19th century term. My daughter said, Mom, no, nobody today is going to know what that means. She's 26. I said, girl, bye. Uh, we know what it means, right? Brooding. So brooding over bloody revenge, enslaved women's lethal resistance. And it's about black women. They said that we didn't resist slavery with, with lethal violence. That's what they said. And I said, no one black women? I doubt it. So I got into the archive, and I dug, and I dug up some of the funniest stories. I mean, not that murder is funny. Shame, Nikki, shame, shame, shame. <laughs> but the story, these women are so colorful. And my daughter said, how did you find women that are like you, Mom, in the archive? <laughs> like, their personalities are just so colorful. They plotted and planned these acts of resistance for weeks, years, to get their owners back for these things that they did. And my argument is that this is a type of justice that they got. And they seized it for themselves. And they plotted, they brought in people to help them. And unlike slaved, enslaved men's slave revolts, theirs were successful. <laughs> Because they knew how to plan, and, and they uh, only brought in people to help that they trusted. And so it's, it's very pr provocative. But the, and so, um, so that book has, and it's my only non-Cincinnati book. That, when I say I was done with Cincinnati, <laughs> that was it. But it, it has, it's, it's funny. It's sad, but it's, it's funny. Because... <laughs> Like, it's like funny, and um, because they were just cutting up. They were cutting up. Like, one woman claimed that um, somebody else started a, a fire. She tried to kill her owner's family, and then she said that uh, the person uh, who did it put a letter on a side of loaf of bread and brought it to her jail and it was just and so, you know it was just all of this funny stuff they had these fantastical stories and so um it, it'll make you laugh and then you'll be like oh my god i'm so evil 
<laughs> they killed these people, and I'm like this, like yeah, this confirms I'm like very evil, and so um, yeah. But a part of you is like it's because it's so long ago. You feel okay laughing because you know it's so long ago, and we all believe maybe maybe the owners maybe deserved it or something. We think. So all yeah. Right. Well, we want to thank. To, oh, all right. Last last thing. I have to say something just because I am so grateful that you came for me. I can't tell you that. I, I, mean, I love right. you, Shelly. <laughs> but I just want to say one of the things that I always knew about you here in the time that we were... Um, We've been friends forever. Fighting, yes. When we were fighting academics together when we were fighting the um, machine together yeah. I won't yeah. I won't put too fine a point on on that fight I, I you know I really always thought of the phrase associated you uh, with you that a prophet is not without honor except within his own country except that this was my, our our Cincinnati history prophet who was being silenced and for mm. I, I think you know there were people I, I think one of the things that's so powerful about your work that has to be said is it's so much easier not to believe it it's so much easier not to hear your truth because your truth is always the truth we are not there yet you started off this lecture today it's worse than it was it, 20 years ago in civil rights is worse than it was 20 years ago. It's worse than it was, you know, years a, ago. Yeah. and that it's worse. And because you refuse, you reject toxic positivity, you reject false narratives, you reject institutional um, falsities and, uh, you know, trumpery and, um, all, you know, uh, puffery and all those things. And you insist on the truth and you just keep telling it. And as much pain as it costs, as much as it costs you, it has enriched our world Ooh. so much. It's such a legacy. Um, Dr. Nikki Taylor, I'm so glad. Yeah. That was the most beautiful thing anybody has said about my career. I love you. <laughs> and I needed to hear that. And I needed all of you today. Um, it's just been a beautiful um, audience, a beautiful conversation. Thank you for receiving me. I will always love Cincinnati. Um, keep fighting. Don't give up on this city. You cannot. This is my daughter's hometown. <laughs> All right. She's really proud of She's a medical doctor. <laughs> so one black doctor got out of, out of here. But, you know, right. but I, I just, I, I love this city, and I always will. And keep fighting for a better future for this city. But thank you all, and thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. We do have refreshments out in the atrium. And again, we want to thank the First Unitarian Church for hosting us. We also want to thank Houston Group, our lecture sponsor, and the friends of Harry Beecher Stowhouse Board, and of course, Dr. Taylor. <laughs>